Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Finnovate Podcast. Joining me today, we have Jacqueline Baker, author of The Unexpected Leader and founder of Scarlet Communications. Jacqueline, thank you so much for taking the time to connect with me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Greg. So we're going to get into the book in a little bit, but can you start by just introducing yourself and and kind of how you came to be in the role that you're in? Absolutely. I've been in the entrepreneurship space for quite some time. I definitely identify with being those titles that you listed off. I'm an author. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Scarlet Communications, which is a leadership consultancy. But of course, I'm a podcast host as well. And, you know, I am also a self-professed magical hoster at home. I love to host people in my home. Both me and my husband like to do that as well. And I had the opportunity to start my entrepreneur venture in the wedding and event production space in my early 20s. And what ultimately happened is that that opportunity led me to falling in love with a unique part of many of our lives that we don't really think about, but is very active in our lives each and every day. Well, I never really fell in love with event production. I did fall in love with protocol, etiquette, and order. Like I fell in love with this notion of trying to understand like why things happened a certain way, what was etiquette all about. And so what a lot of people don't know, Greg, is that our company, Scarlet Communications, actually started out as a full-fledged leadership consultancy. We were teach actually, I'm sorry, a full-fledged etiquette consultancy. We started out teaching etiquette to teen girls. That's literally how we started the business because no one in Detroit was doing it in a way that we thought really mattered the most, um, a way that was really practical and functional. But after six months of doing that work, Greg, the Detroit Lions called randomly and asked if we would teach etiquette to their rookie players. And I realized- I know. I realized, oh my gosh, maybe more people than just teen girls or community organizations want etiquette training. And truly, we still teach etiquette training to teen girls. It's really important. But that really started the path of me realizing that most organizations weren't asking me to teach etiquette. They were really asking us to help their leaders become better leaders. And so now, 10 years later, almost 11, we are a full-fledged leadership consultancy that helps people see themselves as leaders and elevate to their next level of leadership. But as the final part of this story that I'm sure we'll discuss today, within that 10-year period, something else magical happened. It it was the result of me getting a message in my LinkedIn box. Someone said, hey, Jacqueline, are you interested in an event management consulting position? And I didn't realize essentially what they're asking me is would I be interested in doing some consulting work at one of the nation's largest nonprofits in the event management space? I was truly uninterested in this because I had left the event space, but I took the call. And ultimately what ended up happening is that one call resulted in me having an eight-year career at AARP, ending my career as the vice president of startup programming within AARP Innovation Labs or what is now HTech Collaborative. And so I was able to dual track it, which I know you work with a lot of startups, they're dual tracking it. They have a full-fledged job that they may even love and they're growing their thing at the same time. And so for eight years, I was living in both worlds. And last year, actually eight years to the date, I gave myself permission to go fully, full-fledged and and to scale Scarlet. But that's truly how I started in the entrepreneurship space. The stop that that I made along the way in corporate innovation. And now here I am again as a full-time entrepreneur. Now, that's an amazing story. And and we're definitely going to talk about your experience at AARP in a little bit. But I want to jump in because the book, The Unexpected Leader, I think this is something which happens quite a bit in the fintech space. You know, people found companies because they have great ideas. Um, Maybe they see a hole in the ecosystem that they can go out and fill. But in many cases, you know, the the people who have those ideas are not necessarily natural leaders. And the idea of kind of running a business can be really foreign. And so I'm curious what advice you can offer for people who kind of are thrust in that position where all of a sudden they find themselves responsible for a company um, and, and other people that they have to try and lead. Absolutely. The one thing that I try to do I try hard to remind founders how important it is to see yourself as a leader out the gate. I get the incredible opportunity. I know, Greg, you get this opportunity now as well to coach founders, sometimes founders that are pretty early in their journey. And the earlier that I can get to them in their journey and helping them 
understand their role as a self-leader, but then their buy-in that they are a leader in addition to being an innovator, in addition to making their product or their service as best as it could possibly be, they also are a leader for themselves and potentially, and probably if you're scaling, a leader for others as well. And so if you can have that buy-in immediately, that just helps you along your way. But I get it. Not everyone crosses your path, Greg. Not everyone crosses my path. And they don't get that, almost that reminder that they're a leader. And what I will remind every single one of your founders or your founders to be or founders in the making that are listening today, what I would remind you of is, especially if you have scaling in mind, it's not enough for your technology to be great. It's not enough for your processes to be sound. It's not enough for you to have the top investment that you asked for. It's not enough for you to have the best advisors. Know that there are people that are required to help your thing get greater, to scale your thing. And it's not enough to just say, hey, here's a job in doing that. You also have a very key responsibility in leading people and being intentional in your leading leading journey. Lots of people have different motivation. For some people, they you know money is a high motivator. For some people, they want to feel inclusive. They want to feel like they're connected. And there's no greater way to feel included and to feel connected to a growing organization than by feeling like you are being intentionally led. You have the opportunity when you embrace leadership, you know, at your level as a founder, as a self-leader, as a people, as a, as a leader of others, to really change the face of how someone sees themselves, to change how they see themselves as a leader overall, the decisions that they make. And so founders, you have a very unique opportunity. Investors, you have a unique opportunity. Corporate innovation, you know, leaders all have a unique opportunity to both see yourself as a leader, but also understand your opportunity to impact others as well. Yeah, and I think one of the things that has also really resonated with me is the the theme from some of your work that you know anybody can be a leader and that you can kind of assume some leadership responsibility regardless of whether you currently find yourself in the C-suite or not. You know, and I think one of the things that it really resonated with me is the idea um, that it takes leadership capabilities from people all throughout an organization in order for that organization to be successful. This is particularly acute in a lot of areas in financial technology, where sometimes if you are working at a bank and you're trying to implement a new piece of technology, there's going to be a headwind coming Sometimes even from the C-suite of your own organization, people will be saying, no, we can't do that. We've never done it that way before. We need to try and you know stay in our lane a little bit here. Um, what would you say to somebody who kind of find themselves in this role where they need to be a leader in order to advance their agenda and try and accomplish what they're trying to accomplish, even if they don't necessarily have that kind of institutional weight behind them? They don't have the title yet, or maybe in some cases actually getting a, a headwind from people who outrank them. Mm. I like this question because it allows me to sneak in one of our models that's inside the book. We are huge fans. Of course, we are huge fans on our side over here of the leadership levels. We talk about leadership in levels. It's four different levels. Leadership of self, leadership of others, leadership of communities, which could include your workplace, and leadership of movements. Are those community things that we care deeply about, those causes that change and shake up the world at the movement level. And the reality is you have influential opportunities at all four of those levels, right? If you are someone who's leading an organization or leading at the community level, which can include an organization, you have a unique opportunity to tap into advocates there, um, knowledge that you have there. But a lot of times the challenge comes in play. And you mentioned this just a short while ago, when we're talking about people who don't feel like they have that influence, they don't feel like they have that power. And what I ask people to do is to think about yourself holistically right? Because sometimes we assume that all of the things that we engage in, the skills that we have that we may feel good about or competent in or confident about outside the workplace, that once you walk inside the workplace, those things suddenly go away. And that's the reason why we preach the importance of seeing yourself as a leader in all facets of your life, despite your role, position, status, or title. There are many of you that are listening right now that are deeply responsible for something in your life. You might be responsible for planning the family reunion. You might be responsible for planning the boys' annual golf trip, the girls' annual vacation internationally. And all these things have these underlying leadership qualities and skills embedded in them that you forget. Oh, you know what? I am a good delegator. I am a good negotiator. I'm negotiating the hotel for my family reunion each and every year. I have difficult conversations with my friends. I don't just block them. And we just don't count those things as skills. And so what I would encourage you to do is holistically think about you as a human overall. You don't not become a leader 
because you step front, step, step your foot inside your workplace. You're still a leader holistically. It's just about you giving yourself permission to carry that skill set over the door threshold at your workplace. And so that's the advice that I would give to people that are really trying to think, you know, am I a leader? Am I influential? Can I get this done? Am I really going to be able to move the needle? Think about yourself holistically. Yeah, I mean, it's it's huge. And I think when you start thinking about it in those terms, you start to recognize what you're capable of. And, you know, honestly, we could spend a lot of time talking about the the book and, and a lot of these themes here. I do want to make sure we spend some time also talking about your role um, with AARP Innovation Labs, because that's something that I think will kind of allow us to approach some of this from a different angle. But um, mm-hmm. can you start by just talking about exactly what that final role was, you know, VP of Startup Programming at, at AARP? Absolutely. Before I get there, though, Greg, I do want to just take a trip over to how that came to be right before I talk about the role. And the reason why I think taking a trip here is so important is because I get a chance to talk about how important it is for people to remain curious and flexible and nimble. Um, When I started consulting work at ARP, which is how I started it, quite frankly, I was not looking for a job at all. But one thing that I am very consistent in doing is having the conversation, right? And so there are some founders that are listening or some people, some professionals that are listening or just somebody who is a fan of your podcast listening that is laser focused on something. And I do believe that you should be laser focused on the things that you care about, but not so much that you're not able to look left or look right a little bit to be curious. I have remained curious throughout my career, my corporate career and also my entrepreneurial career. And honestly, that curiosity has been what's opened up the most doors for me. Instead of saying, nope, I'm going to do it this way. This is exactly how I am. And it's only going to be this way. It has opened up and unlocked these unknown unknown doors, including being the vice president of startup programming at AARP Innovation Labs. I started out there doing some consulting work, eventually transitioned in and serving essentially as someone's chief of staff. And when they left, the head of innovation at the time said, hey, I looked you up and I want you to come over here. Would you be interested in this? And me never, never playing a role in any innovation space whatsoever said, okay, let's give it a try here, all while growing Scarlet at the same time. And I'm really proud of what we were able to build within AARP Innovation Labs. You'll see AARP Innovation Labs referred to a little bit more now as HTech Collaborative, and they built out an amazing product and an amazing community for investors and startups and um, and also places to, to launch your product and to do pilots, et cetera. But truly, when we first started that work, we hadn't really done a lot with startups. We didn't have cohorts there. We weren't sending startups to pitch competitions and to conference engagements like they are now. Like literally, ARP builds almost a little village inside a consumer electronics show and at, at some other health tech and fintech conferences. They show up, but they show up in a way where their startups can shine bright. And so the things that we were able to build there and work on and push the envelope there, I am still eternally proud of it. And quite frankly, Greg, what I did not expect, I did not expect to continue to do work in the startup space when I left. I was planning to really leave and continue to do my leadership consultancy work that I do for corporations and individuals all across the globe. But lo and behold, lots of organizations have called me back to say, hey, can you coach our startups? Can you help them be better presenters? Can you help them see themselves as leaders? And so it's so many lessons in that from number one, stay curious. Number two, be flexible. And number three, please minimize your burning of bridges along the way, right? Because I could have left <laughs> and kicked up a bunch of dust, right? And caused the whole hoopla walking out the door and no one from the industry would have called me back again. But I'm really grateful to still serve in the startup space, to still have the honor. You know, Greg, sometimes I'm sure you've experienced this. You sit with startups and you're just like, oh my gosh, like this is going to change the world. Like this is so impactful. And to be able to have that behind the door, closed conversation with the startup that's just getting started and you can guide their decisions and give them insight and best practices. I'm telling you, it for me is just a really humbling and honorable experience. So that was my world there. And I'm I'm proud of that stop. I'm grateful for that stop. And I'm grateful and really excited about the work that they're continuing to do. And man, so many lessons to pull out of that for the fintech community. And I think there's there's a couple that I just want to highlight. And I think the first one is 
you know, the, the, around staying curious, recognizing that just because something has been done that way all the time doesn't mean we need to keep doing it. And I think this is something that we see with the companies who are successful at the Finnovate stage, the companies who go on and do amazing things in the industry. This is something which you hear a lot about. Somebody will have a good idea. They might get a lot of feedback. They might pivot and do something completely different based on the feedback they've got, or they might discover something and think, you know, how is that process actually working? Can I make it better? So I think yeah. that's that's massive, a massive lesson for the for the industry. I think the other one, which which sometimes gets overlooked, you know, in the fintech space, we sometimes assume that everybody who's in this space has always been in the fintech space, and that's just yeah. not the case. People come into this community from a wide variety of backgrounds, and whenever you are talking to somebody, even you know whatever role they are filling right now, they might be coming at it from a place that's completely different from where you are, and it just really puts this pressure on being able to connect with people from a wide variety of different backgrounds and also being able to explain yourself to a wide variety of, of types of people who maybe don't have the same expertise in the same areas that you have. And so mm -hmm. there's there's just a huge amount to unpack there. Um, I, I do want to just quickly, and, and I see we're kind of coming up on the end of our time, but we can go a little bit over here. Um, I do want to quickly just talk about what advice you might have for companies who are kind of looking to cut through the noise. In, in your role at AARP Innovation Labs, you must have seen a lot of different people who want to get involved in that program, and you would have to make some hard decisions about who you have room for and who you don't. What advice do you have for companies who find themselves in that kind of environment where they have to make themselves a priority in that type of competitive environment? Yeah. And making themselves a priority can mean a couple of different things. Right. Um, it could totally mean taking care of yourself. Right. Because, you know, a lot of a lot of startups like push themselves to the brink, crash and burn. Right. In terms of their body and mind and all that good stuff. So there's that taking taking care of yourself overall. The other part of taking care of yourself or even prioritizing you, what you're building is just being honest or even being aware by way of us having this conversation about where corporate partnerships, corporate innovation arms, partnerships overall in general, where there might be a little bit of quicksand that you need to be aware of, right? And you spoke just a second ago and we had a nice little conversation before we kicked off just about how startups talk about themselves. A significant deciding factor for organizations and investors lies in your ability to be concise and talk about what you're doing in a way that is relatable, in a way that's charismatic, and in a way that's succinct. And while yes, Greg, a lot of smart people listen to your podcast and a lot of smart people are in the fintech and health tech space and lots of other tech spaces, truly getting to the root of making sure that you're sharing the with them when you're talking about your thing, what's in it for me, and making sure the other person understands that is critically important in prioritizing your business and making sure that you're showing up right. The second thing is really being what I call coachable, which I'm sure you appreciate this, Greg. And when I say coachable, I mean in understanding that Everything isn't going to always go your way because you might have some cutting edge technology that is going to change the world. There is red tape that exists within every organization that you just got to be aware of. If it's not policy, if it's not accounts receivable, if it's not the OGC legal team, there's just some things, some rules that organizations can't bend, can't break. It doesn't matter matter how, how awesome you are. And being coachable enough for you to understand that and figure out like how can we approach this in another way, it's hugely important as well. The last tip that I'll give is in the branding space. I'm hoping that lots of startups and professionals overall that are listening today, drop your name into the Google box or the Bing box or whatever your search engine is. Just drop it in there every now and then. Drop your company name in there. Because a lot of organizations will totally go the other way with collaborating with startups because the brand that you have online doesn't have a good reflection of who you think you are or who you could be. And brands like big brands, big organizations spend a lot of money, right, on their brand presence, on their NPS score, et cetera. So they want to make sure if they're collaborating with you that you are in alignment with the brand that they want to represent or the brand that they've worked so hard on. And so, yes, when you think about taking care of you, it is equally like not burning yourself out, not going too far, making sure that you're getting a community around you to keep you together. But it also is making sure that you prioritize those things to make you shine bright so you're not working harder versus working smarter. So that's how I would answer that, Greg. Man, thanks for that. That's, again, some really valuable insights there. So I want to end on potentially a slightly more lighthearted question, which is just coming back to the old cliche, you know, the best leaders don't seek out leadership positions, but rather have leadership thrust upon them. Is that mm -hmm. true? I think that is true. And unfortunately, I think that 
or fortunately, however you want to look at it, it could be another way. And it could be another way if we as early as possible in our lives saw ourselves as leaders. Because typically what happens, Greg, and I experienced this, maybe you experienced it too. At some point, you were good at your job. You were good at what you did. And then your job or your department got big and all of a sudden it was, all right, Greg, now we're going to bring some other people in and lead these people. And then you're just like, wait a minute. Like I, I knew how to do my job well, but now you want me to like manage people and make sure they're doing their job well too? Like my goodness. And so I do think that a lot of times it turns into a, you were a rock star, you were doing great. And so you're almost being rewarded, right? For your team growing, but sometimes it ends up feeling like a punishment because you end up dealing with things that you were never taught how to deal with. And it's not like all of a sudden you just give them your, give them more of your work and then that's it. They go away. You actually have right. to talk to people <laughs> and grow these people, right? And so, yes, I do believe that most times it is thrust upon them and then they have to figure it out. But sometimes it ends up them crashing and burning because they have not been properly developed as a leader. Man, I, I completely agree. And it's like, I think you've got a crystal ball you can see into every organization that's come across our stage for the last uh, several years there. <laughs> so um, again, I've been talking to Jacqueline Baker, author of The Unexpected Leader. Check out the book, check out Scarlet Communications. And Jacqueline, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. And thank you for the work that you're continuing to do in the fintech space. It's an important sector. It's important work. And I know that the startups that you're working with and the ecosystem that you're growing will continue to change the world. So thank you for your work. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening.